that's my announcement. Thanks for coming out today. It's a blessing. Would you guys begin our service with a song? As long as it's a good song. <laughs> All right, everybody's got to stand. Okay. stand right <laughs> well, if you can. <laughs> so we're filling in for Ocean's not feeling good today, so we got to call some parents this morning. So there we are. So we're going to make a joyful sound to the Lord today. Everybody from camp, help us out. You know, you know the song. Wake your eyes and see a new song of joy and celebration. A new day has come with grace to the Son of God, of God. Awake your eyes and sing a new song of joy and celebration. A new day has come with grace to the Son of God, of God. Do we want to do a round? A few rounds at camp all the time. <laughs> So, Marianne will leave this side. Oh, we're what? Go <laughs> on. We'll be over here. Wake up, rise, and sing a new song of joy and celebration. A new day has come, sing a new song of joy and celebration. <laughs> two two years in a row. Thank thank the Lord it hasn't asked me yet this year. So that's been great. Good morning, and I'm so glad to see you this morning. I'm glad to be out here with you. Um, I've spent a couple weeks at well months at Camp Gilbert. And it's been wonderful having everyone up there. It was raining a lot up at camp, and now we were just at Wilder where we're building and and uh, Homedale, it was raining this morning, and I thought, oh, we'll be inside, and got here, and it quit about <laughs> chicken dinner road, <laughs> the rain's over there, <laughs> so it's been really fun. Um, at camp, we've been blessed for the last few years, when you're a program director, you have to study the program, right, or you should, and um, I try and make it so it becomes part of a normal thought, and as I do the call to worship this morning, um, I want to share with you just three quick themes. It was beyond belief. Beyond my belief it was one three years ago. And then last year, is this is our prayer. And that we pray for each other and pray for our church and pay, pray for our community and pray for ourselves. But that we don't divide, that we join and come together. And that was a wonderful time of this is our prayer. This next year is the fruit of the spirits. And if you're not sure what the fruit of the spirits are, I think that is the beautiful time to really find them, look for them, encourage them, be the source of them. It's just fantastic. So this next year is the fruit of the spirits, and um, yes, we'll have signs with fruit and all that, but we really are the love and the fellowship that comes at camp, comes from here, and goes to there, the, and and back. But I want you to know. That it's been a fantastic um, couple of years building and being part of camp, but it's been fa more fantastic to be here and support camp from here. This morning's um, scripture, uh, you know what, let's start with prayer. Let's begin with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for those truths that we receive from your word and from our leadership, and from each other. Thank you, Father, for the love, the joy that comes from service, and just the feeling of family that we get from you, our Father, and from our brothers and sisters. Help us this morning to share all those wonderful truths as we worship together. Amen. 
Today is Luke, and it's Luke 5, 12 through uh, 15, and um, it is the man with leprosy. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell to his face and fell to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately, the leprosy left him. Then Jesus offered him, in fact, ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer a sacrifice that Moses commanded for you, your cleaning as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread more, so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places, to the mountains, and prayed. May God be blessed by the reading of his word. Now another song. This one is motions also. So anybody from camp that wants to stand up? It's very easy. <laughs> I know some know this. Sorry. Have a seat Thank you. 
says that we judge ourselves by our intentions, but we learn to judge others by their actions. And that's something profound in that. Uh, we've ran a lot of businesses that, that um, yeah, our intentions were great. We, uh, we wanted to do the right thing, but we didn't get the oomph that needed it. I ask that you think about it today and not just have great intentions, but follow through with great actions. join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the blessings that you give us all day, every day. Thank you, Father, for these gifts, these offerings, that you may further encourage us to do our best following you and helping others. Amen. I know it's going to be hard to pull the kids away from the equipment over there. Summer. Yeah. Want to come down? We got a kid's story. I'll come down. Or do you want to just do it up there? <laughs> You're, you got it. Let's go over here on the table. You can come down and join us when you want to, Summer. All right. So, here's my question for you. Are you guys good runners? Yeah. Are you? How far can you run? Can you run a mile? Maybe. Maybe. How far have you run before in the past? Have you have you gone like around the track at school? Yeah. Once? Uh, Twice? Wait, four times. Five. Four? Five times? Guess what? 
Um, what? Uh, so, uh, when I go to school, Mr. Mack wants us to do one lap. Okay, one, one lap's pretty good. How many of you all could run a lap around a high school track? Oh, yeah, some of the high, the high school kids are like, yeah. <laughs> how about over there in that neck of the woods? <laughs> yeah. yeah. How about, how about ten laps? You'd get tired of that. How about a hundred laps? Oh my goodness. Now we're just talking crazy, right? That's that you know what? Nobody can run for at well, somebody might be able to run a hundred laps, but nobody can run forever. Well, it's true. I mean, you could, but you could but yeah? you can't really run how, in the How would you how would you run forever? What would you have to do in order to just keep running and running and running? You'd have to sleep and drink. That sleep part is what I want to think about. You might have to rest once in a while, right? If you ran a lap and then took a little break and then ran another lap and took another break and ran another lap, you might be able to go pretty much forever that way. Well, not really forever, but a long time. You know why that's true? Because rest is important. Do your parents tell you that? You need to get your rest. Yeah, my dad's like, yeah. go to bed. You need to go to bed. <laughs> go to bed. And sometimes you're like, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go to bed. Yeah. I want to sleep with my dog. Well, getting rest is really important for us to be healthy. And God wants us to rest. You know that he's provided a whole day every week for us to rest? Yeah, it's called the Sabbath. That's true. We're supposed to rest at least one day a week. Put everything aside and take a break. That's what God wants us to do. Because God knows that we can't run forever either. He wants us to get the rest that we need. Oh, that's a good question. We'll talk about that later. Can God run forever? We'll talk about that at some other time. <laughs> All right. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us an opportunity to run and also to rest. We know that both are important in our lives and that we need to do one in order to do the other. So help us not to just try to keep running all the time, but to take a moment or two and take a break. We thank you for the opportunity to rest and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You guys can go. And I think that there's something for the uh, high school kids. All right. Follow, follow them. They're going this way if you want to go with them. <laughs> yeah. yep. kids, are, kids are doing stuff in there. Wow, that kind of shifted the balance here, didn't it? Oh, boy. Yeah, we got to sing louder on this side. We'll, get, we'll carry. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was fun. I sing better standing, so if you'd like to sing standing, please do so. <laughs> All right, what song is it? I've got to remember one. You all know this. I've got to remember one.
Do you love being adaptable? I know adaptability isn't, sometimes it's tough. Sometimes we get into patterns, we're kind of flowing along, that's the way we like to do things, and somebody throws us a curve, like our song leader being sick, for heaven's sakes, boy, what in the world? And then uh, the power goes out and we, we lose our, and we're out here today, which is a little bit different. That was kind of planned. It wasn't completely uh, out of left field, but uh, thank you all for being willing to share in this time. Monitor and adjust. There you go, Dan. That's right. We monitor and adjust. I want to invite you, if you would, to turn in Mark's Gospel to the sixth chapter for our scripture today. Um, the scripture that Byron read earlier, it's a great story of healing, isn't it? I want you to pay a special close attention to the spaces at the beginning and the end of these stories. I think that that's where we're going to we're going to look at a little more closely. So I'm going to pick up reading in that sixth chapter at the 30th verse. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all of the towns and arrived ahead of them. And as he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages, and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Are we to go? <laughs> Are we to go uh, and, and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, Well, how much do you have? How many loaves have you? Go and see. And they found out, and they said, Five and two fish. And he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups of the hundreds and the fifties. And taking the loaves and fishes, the five loaves and two fishes, he broke up, looked up to heaven and he blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those that had eaten the loaves numbered five thousand men. Another example of adaptable congregation. They weren't anticipating that, but they had a chance to enjoy in that, enjoy that feast. They used to call Christians the followers of the way. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. In Acts chapter 9, Saul, uh, soon to become Paul, he asks for letters to go to the synagogues in Damascus so that he could ferret out any of the followers of the way that were there and arrest them and drag them back to Jerusalem to stand trial. That's a good description, the way. It flushes out our life with Jesus pretty well. Jesus was always on the way, on the road to somewhere, and if we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to be the followers of Jesus, then, then we're going to follow that same path. We're going to be on that same way. You can't follow Jesus and not be on the same road that he's on, right? That's just basic logic. You can't, if Jesus is going to Samaria, then you can't stay in Jerusalem and expect to consider yourself a follower. You're either going with him on the way or you're not. Simple as that. And Jesus is headed on the way and we're going to follow. It's what followers do. Now, obviously, we're not talking about this in a physical sense anymore, like the first disciples were able to experience it. So we do understand this in kind of a metaphorical or a spiritual way now. We're following the way when we do the things that Jesus did. That's the idea. When we, when we, uh, the things that we think Jesus would, would, would encounter, the things that Jesus would do, that's what we embrace. If he were here, we would do the same thing if he's not seated as he is with the Father above. So we're still following, right? We're still following, but we're following the presence of God and the Holy Spirit now. 
following in the same way that the disciples followed Jesus physically while they were here on earth, while he was here on earth all those years ago. So I want to throw out a few things, some destinations along the way, places that we might find ourselves if we're still following this way. We might find ourselves among the poor or the marginalized. You see, Jesus didn't hobnob with the influential or the famous that much. He did spend time with everyone, but it wasn't like he was exclusive in that way. When the standard wisdom of the world said, you know, these are the people you need to hang out with, you're going to have a lot more influence if you spend time with the ruling class. Jesus was more inclined to, and interested in the least of these, the last. That's where Jesus was. He connected with beggars and with the lame and the sick, with the foreigners, the outcasts, the sinners and tax collectors. These are people that Jesus spent time with. They were on the way that Jesus was traveling, the way he was headed. And it seems like sometimes he kind of intentionally sought them out. It wasn't like they were coincidentally there. He went directly to them. He talked to women at wells in Samaria. He healed and cast out demons in the regions of the Gentiles. He even healed a Roman centurion's servant. His way led to a place where children were valued instead of being pushed off to the side these are all places on the way that Jesus traveled, and they are places that we will come to if we are following the same way. Another place that we may find ourselves on this way is among the hungry. That's what our story is about today, the, the heart of the text that we just read, the feeding of the multitudes in this deserted place. Now, that is the part that draws our attention, just like the leper in the in the account that Byron read earlier. It, it catches our eye. We, we pay attention to the miracle. Uh, it's what we look at the most. It's, it's the core of Jesus' compassion. The Mark text says that Jesus saw this great crowd. He, he witnessed them. He has compassion on them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And so he teaches them. He spends the day with them. And he's there with them always, feeding them spiritual food. And then later in the day, he feeds them physical food as well. And it's a great work. It's a wonder, isn't it, that miracle? The disciples, they're told to go out after the meal, and they head out at the baskets, and they start collecting all the pieces, and 12 big baskets full of leftovers. Really, truly a miracle. It's a powerful testament to Jesus' power. Compassion that not only ministers to the spiritual needs of people, but the physical ones too. And the disciples are right there with him, right there along the way, witnessing it, participating in it. A little reluctantly at first, yes, but eventually they're fully engaged. They love this. They're on the way, the way that Jesus is leading them. That's right at the center of the text that we've looked at in Mark. But like I said, I want us to pay a little attention to the verses that hold this heart. Let's begin in that 30th verse. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to, to open them and look at this. Verse 30, uh, right at the beginning, we might learn a little more about this way, something that goes beyond the loaves and fishes and miraculous feasts. So at the beginning of the text, in that 30th verse, we see that the disciples have, have come back to Jesus, and they're telling Jesus about what happened to them on this mission that they were on. We don't know about it unless we look further back in that same sixth chapter, and you see that Jesus, he'd been out in the villages and the towns, and he's teaching, and he says to his disciples, I want you to go out. I want you to go out, pair up, just like in grade school, pair up, go out, cast out demons, heal the sick, proclaim the gospel, and then come back and tell me what you experienced. This is them telling Jesus what they'd experienced. Now, think about this. They'd been out there in the region, they'd been talking to people, they'd been encountering folks that were sick, the demon-possessed, and they'd been doing these miraculous things. Do you think they were excited about it? Oh, yeah. I'll bet you they were really excited about it. They were, they were pumped up. They'd been given this power over these spiritual forces, forces that had, that had subjugated them and ruled them for so long. Now they're, they have power over sickness. They'd witnessed some miraculous stuff. They participated in some miraculous stuff. And, and if human nature is any indication, I'll bet they were pretty stoked about it. Let me tell you what we did, Jesus. They're going to 
spill the tales all night long. But that's not really what Jesus was focused on. What Jesus does, instead of patting them on the back and encouraging them and, and, and pumping them up, what he does is call them away from that work. He says, you know what? Let's, let's get out of here for a while. Let's take a break. Let's go to some place where we can get some rest. Because this is what's happening. Word is out now, guys. Word is out. People are coming from all over. They're trying to be around Jesus. They're trying to be around the disciples. I want to include the disciples here now because they've got the same reputation. They've been doing the same things that Jesus had been doing, and so they're coming to them as well. And Jesus says, you know what? Let's get out of here for a while. Let's take off. Let's get some rest. And so they get in a boat, and they depart for a deserted place. This is a destination on the way that Jesus is leading them. What it is, I think you might recognize it, this is a classic retreat that he's trying to take them on. A moment of breath in an otherwise hectic life. And I want to be clear, just like we shared with the kids, rest is important. For those of you who've gone without rest for a period of time, you know what it's like. It, it wears you down. Rest is important. I want you to take a moment and do a little self-diagnostic here. Take your own pulse, if you will. I want to ask some questions, and you get to think about the answers to these. Do you feel exhausted frequently? Maybe right now. I don't know. Do you have uh, frequent headaches or stomach problems? Do you, do you get sick, and is it hard to shake it? Does it just seem to, to hang on? Do you have trouble getting good sleep? Are you short of breath? Now some behavioral symptoms. Are you unreasonably irritable? This is a question you should ask yourself. Don't ask your neighbor whether you're unreasonably irritable. Do, do, are your emotions excessive? Do they, do they spill out in, in weird and excessive ways? Do you find yourself stuck in stubbornness or, or rigid thinking? It has to be this way. Are you frequently pessimistic? Are you trapped in negativity or cynicism? These are all classic symptoms of burnout. Probably heard that phrase. People talk about it a lot these days. Living a life that's too much go and not enough slow. It's a life out of rhythm. Psychologists have a label for it, which I kind of like. Over-functioning. We're supposed to function, but sometimes we over-function. We do too much. People who overfunction, they it's almost like they're addicted to the approval that comes when they become that go-to person. The one that everybody counts on to get whatever that needs to be done, done. They've convinced themselves that they that if they don't do the work, then it's not going to happen. And because they overfunction, because they continually take things on, because they're the ones that are giving others a pass on the work that they could do and should do, then the rest of the group is more than willing to just keep loading them up. They'll do it. Give it to them. They like to do it, doing more and more with less and less. And they burn out. And they need a rest. And Jesus knew all about this. Jesus knew all about this. The disciples, they had been, perhaps, over-functioning. They come back to Jesus. They've been on this really successful mission, getting a lot done for the kingdom. And they were probably tired, but they were just buzzing. The adrenaline was still rushing. They just, the, the approval of the people, the, the fact that they kept coming, had to be intoxicating. And so there may have been this temptation to just keep at it, keep going, keep casting out the demons, keep healing folks, keep proclaiming the gospel. They're here. The people are following us around, seeking us out inviting them to overfunction, But Jesus says, that's not the way. That's not the way. And he invites them on retreat. Now retreat, it teaches us something important. It teaches us that we are not the center of the universe. I know that comes as a surprise to you all, right? <laughs> we are not the center of the universe. It doesn't revolve around us. We are not the most important thing. Now, I know, 
sometimes we think that's eh, kind of selfish to go off on retreat. You know, it's, it, we even use phrases like self-care when we talk about that kind of thing. It seems a little, a little self-centered. Uh, but I want you to think about this in relation to this tendency that some of us have to over-function if you're one of those people. If you have to go away to this quiet place to rest, if maybe someone compels you, as Jesus tried to compel the disciples, to go away to this quiet place to rest, what is going through your head? I'll bet it is everything that is still at home not getting done. It's there. It's plaguing us. And maybe this was what the disciples were thinking. What do you mean, Jesus? How? Go off on a rest? Go off to get to, to, on a retreat? Shouldn't we be working? Shouldn't we continue to heal? Shouldn't we continue to proclaim? Aren't there demons that need to be cast out? There's stuff to do, Jesus. Shouldn't we be doing it? Well, consider what God is doing when he tells us to honor and keep the Sabbath. That's Sabbath. That is sort of a weekly retreat, if you will. A chance to rest. A chance to recuperate and recharge. It's an opportunity that we have to stop over-functioning. A chance to remind ourselves that this work of the kingdom that is so important and that we're so excited about doing does not rest solely on our shoulders. That it is God that is the one that is doing the redeeming. And that we can trust God. We can trust that God is working for this redemption of the world even when we lay it down and take a break and recuperate. Is there work to do? You bet. Always. Absolutely. Does God want us to participate in that work? Yes. Yes. But does all of that depend upon us? Will the whole thing go to rack and ruin if we're not right in the middle of it? No. God is bigger than that. There's a little blending here. We're, we're, we're kind of tearing down some boundaries and letting things flow together. A blending of the kingdom work uh, and the work of our ordinary lives, that day-to-day -day stuff that we do, that we all need to do. God certainly wants us to participate in this redemptive kingdom work, proclaiming, making disciples, that, that sort of thing. There's genuinely, and I will stand by this, there is genuinely no higher purpose for humanity than to do that, to, to work for God's kingdom. That is our crowning work, the kingdom work. But we also put bread on the table. We also have things that we need to do, uh, and that can give glory to God as well. But it seems a little more mundane, not mundane in a, in a boring or inconsequential way, but mundane of this earth, the mundus, this world that, that we live in. And both of those things have to be kept in their proper place. We need to have some balance. Both of them fall under the Sabbath mandate. So this is what I'm saying. You can't over-function when it comes to the mundane stuff, the day-to-day -day bread on the table stuff. There's always a lot to do, yes, and we can get tempted and we can get caught in being what they call a work martyr, sacrificing yourself for the sake of the job. We convince ourselves that, that God's going to understand, you know, our ox is in the well and we've got to get it out, that's what the Bible says, you know, so we're going to do that and we're going to head on out and do more and more and more. And the reality is that there's a little bit of selfishness to that. When we over-function like that, it's almost like we're saying that we don't trust that God will take care of things. I know you said you would, God. I know you said it was okay for us to take a day off a week, but I'm not sure I really believe that. We edge a little bit closer to that original sin, trying to be like God. Because, I'll tell you this, there's only one that can get it all done. And as much as you think your mom is the one that can get it all done, even moms have trouble. It's God. God is the only one that can get it all done. We also can't overfunction when it comes to the kingdom work that God puts in our hands as well. Just because it is our highest purpose 
uh, to serve God, that is our greatest work. It doesn't mean that we have to do all of it. Overfunctioning, it's not sanctified and made holy just because the work itself is holy. You can do the right thing in the wrong way here. So, you can't keep running. You've got to take a rest. If for no other reason than to remind yourself that it is God alone who is capable of saving the world. When Jesus says it, we need to listen. Come away and rest. The way of Jesus is not always towards more work. Now, this passage that we read out of Mark, there's a lot in there that just tells the story. It's what they call descriptive. Uh, it's not that this is what you need to do necessarily. I don't think that the disciples, or Jesus for that matter, really got the rest that they needed in this passage. I think that was taken away from them. They get in the boat, they go out to this deserted place, and when they get there, who's there to meet them? The crowd. I mean, they raced there for the villages on the shore to get there so that they could, they could encounter Jesus and, and the disciples. So there's no rest. There's, there's no retreat. The people are all gathered in expectation. And so Jesus adapts. Adapted. Jesus adapts to the situation, and he shifts gears, and his compassion comes to the forefront. That compassion, it preempts their plan for a retreat. But I don't think that's what Jesus wanted. I don't think that's what he really wanted, but it is what he had to deal with. It was what he was confronted with, the need of the people. And so there's this tension, this ever-present need that is there, and then our need to recuperate and rest. And how we work through that tension is the tough thing. It's a difficult tension to resolve. I think a lot of us would love it if the Sabbath mandate were absolute. As if we were made to do it. You have to do it. You cannot not do it. It's easier that way. It kind of lets us off of that personal responsibility of choosing to observe the Sabbath. <coughs> Jesus should have said to the crowd, you know what? We need to take a break. Sorry, everybody. We're not here to teach right now. We're not here to do that. Y'all need to go home. Come back in a few days and we'll pick it up then. You need to respect our space. We need to have a, we need to have a rest. Jesus could have said that. Jesus wants that. He wants the, the disciples to have some rest, but there's no rest at that point. So what's the lesson for us? It's not that rest isn't important or less important. We see Jesus all the time trying to do this, trying to get away for some rest, the, the passage that Byron read, you heard it there, right? Jesus wants to go away to a solitary place. Just a few verses on in this sixth chapter of Mark, there's another section. Jesus departs to a solitary place to pray. He wants to get away, he wants to have this rest, needs this rest. So Jesus doesn't stop looking for it. It remains important. But that compassion is important too. I think we can take a step towards resolving this tension when we remember that there's always going to be a place for compassion. You're not ever going to escape that. It's always going to be there. The need of the world is great. It's endless, it seems at times. And if we're the kind of person that's more prone to the rest, to stepping away from work, more rest than we really need, if when it comes to kingdom work, we're under-functioning instead of over-functioning, then that ever-present need that is there should function like a needle that pokes us, a sting that stings us, something that convicts us. It should be sharp and irritating to the point that we can't ignore it. We shouldn't be able to get rest when that need is right there in front of us. Jesus has led us to it. Let us on this way, and we're going to encounter need along the way. And so for those that retreat too much, that spend a little too much time in rest, let that need goad you into action. But for all of us, we can't forget that whatever it is that God is calling us to do, that the ultimate reconciliation of all things, that is something that God accomplished. We participate, we share, but it is done by God through the blood of Christ. It's God's work. We're ministers of it, as Paul says in Colossians, but that actual restoration is a gift from God. So we need to advance when it's necessary. 
to step with compassion into the need of the world. When there are sheep without a shepherd, we need to introduce them to the good shepherd. And that's work. Holy work. And we need to do it. But when Jesus says, take a break, when Jesus says, step back a moment and rest, we need to obey that too. Because he's in charge, after all. It is his way that we are on. So where are you? I know I'm talking to a mixed group here. Some of you are probably saying, yeah, that part resonates, that part less. I don't know. Maybe you're an underfunctioner. maybe you're an overfunctioner. Maybe you do a lot of this, maybe you do a lot of that. I, I don't know where you are, but you do. Are you an overfunctioner? Are you burning out in the work that you're doing? Is that overfunctioning a source of pride? Do you feel a little more worthy because you're doing so much, trying to get by on no rest. If the weight of the world feels like it's on your shoulders, how much of it did you put there? Do you need to listen to Jesus and obey when he says, come away and rest? God is perfectly fine with that. Perfectly fine with the retreat now and again. He's actually commanded us to take one once a week. It's there in the Bible. So, if that's where you're at. <coughs> but maybe you're on the other side of the equation. Maybe when it comes to following the way, there's a little too much retreat and not enough advance. It's possible that you've got it into a pattern of over-functioning in all of that mundane human stuff. Busy at work, busy at home, busy, busy, busy. Not enough time for God. So many things, so, many, so much busyness like Martha in the kitchen. You've lost sight of what God wants you to do. You don't have time for the compassion. You don't have time for the, the love. Other things take precedence. It's just, i, I got to get it done. See, Jesus called his disciples away from holy work in order to take rest and retreat. Jesus may be calling us too, but calling us away from that profane distractions. And not to rest, but to advance. Advance for the sake of the gospel. As much as we might want to avoid it, I don't think these questions are hard to answer. I think you know. I think you know where you stand. I think you know what you're doing. You know more about the state of your being than, than maybe you'd want to admit. I know I do. I struggle with this. A little confession being good for the soul here. This is not somebody who's figured it all out and telling you what you need to do because they know what to do. This is just a brother read this in the Word, and said, hey, I, I, I struggle with this. I have a hard time with it. I'm just as convicted about this as anybody. So we know where we stand. The question may not be hard to answer, but that answer may be hard to face. Retreat and advance. Taking a rest, going forth in compassion. God is okay if you take the rest you need. You're not failing if you take a break once in a while. You can't just keep running laps forever. you got to rest. And Jesus invites you into that rest. Over-functioning, sometimes an attempt to gather glory for ourselves, gives no glory to God. And we need that retreat to remind us of God's life-giving strength. That is a, a periodic testament to God's sovereignty in our lives. You're in charge, Lord. And I'll take a moment to recognize that. But don't let retreat be all that you're about. Once we've reoriented our hearts, once we've gained that restoration and that recuperation, then we need to move forward. We need to advance. The kingdom demands it. We've got to get back in the game. Aware of our limitations, of course. But Jesus is always inviting us to go further along that way. Pray with me. Lord, you extend an invitation to each of us. And to some of us, it is to rest, to 
take a moment to just be in your presence, to recuperate, to be restored. Others you invite to advance, to move forward into the need of the world with the compassion that you give us, that you inspire in us. And Lord, we get messed up. We overfunction when we should rest, and we underfunction when we should advance. And so much of it is because we think more of ourselves than we should. We think that everything depends upon us. And so, Lord, when we've allowed that pride to influence the way that we spend our time, that we've convinced ourselves that the, the world won't go on unless we keep working, we ask your forgiveness. Lord, if we've stepped out and checked out and laid down the work that you've had in the that you've placed in our hands and, and that you call us to, we ask your forgiveness. Lord, we seek balance. And we know that that is a balance that only you can give. And so, help us as we follow on this way. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> I think we have the uh, doxology for our closing uh, hymn. So can we all stand if you're able to? Think about the phrase. I mean, just that first part of that. Uh, is so powerful. Praise our Keep us on the path that we need to be on as we follow faithfully. We pray for those who can't be with us today for whatever reason. We ask that you bless them in a special way. Bring them back together with us so that we can worship together soon. And Lord, we just pray that you would keep us faithful and in that balance to rest and to go according to your good purpose. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Invite some of you, if you're able to help us kind of pick up. Other than that, you're dismissed. You may go in peace. <laughs>